Hi everyone, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Sebastian, developer advocate at JetBrains, and I'm excited to talk to you about Kotlin.js in 1.4 and beyond. As the name suggests, we're going to look at the new features and improvements we have added to the JavaScript target for Kotlin. We will also have an outlook of upcoming features, some of which you can already try at home, and some of which we're hard at work to bring to you as soon as possible. So, let's get into it. Let's start out by having a look at what we deliver with the 1.4 release of Kotlin.js, because there are a number of quality of life features included, which are ready for you to enjoy, and which we'll see today. We've really focused our efforts around providing a more unified and cohesive development experience, smoothing out some rough edges. We've also improved the number of settings and integrations you can control directly from your Gradle configuration. So specifically, we are going to look at how the Gradle plugins for Kotlin.js have been unified, new features that were added to the DSL, and how we evolve platform APIs. Let's start with the first topic, the Gradle plugins. Now, as with all technologies, it's important to have a clear entry point. In the case of Kotlin.js, those are the Kotlin multi-platform and Kotlin.js Gradle plugins. They provide a central place to manage the most important facets of a Kotlin project targeting JavaScript. This includes things like the dependencies you want to use, the JS-specific integrations you want to enable, and more. Because these plugins cover all functionality that was previously available in the alternative Gradle plugins, we can officially deprecate those with Kotlin 1.4, and provide you with a clear way to start your project. Now, the JS and multi-platform Gradle plugins actually also provide opinionated integrations for popular tooling from the JavaScript ecosystem. As such, they include a fully managed local YARN installation, which takes care of downloading and installing NPM packages required for your projects. And if your application is targeting the browser, the plugins will also automatically use Webpack as a bundler. This integration means that your code and your resources can be turned into production assets without you having to write any specific configuration to get started. Now, both the multi-platform and the JS Gradle plugin actually expose the same underlying functionality. If you're only targeting Node.js or the browser, the JS plugin provides a simple approach to structure and build your project. But we also see a lot of developers using Kotlin.js alongside other platforms. For example, they share code between their JVM server applications and their browser frontend. Or they share implementations of their business logic between Kotlin multi-platform mobile targets and web applications. In that case, it makes perfect sense to choose the Kotlin multi-platform plugin. To make switching between the two plugins as painless as possible, and to ensure that our materials, examples, and our documentation around Kotlin.js are applicable for both plugins, we've aligned the target naming convention between the JS and multi-platform plugins. This means that a configuration block like this one, setting up the browser target, looks the same whether you use the multi-platform or JS plugin. Next, let's talk a bit about our new support for loading style sheets without having to dive into the depth of Webpack, the bundler that Kotlin.js uses for targeting the browser. Now, Webpack is a very modular bundler that uses so-called loaders to turn files of different types into production assets. On the one hand, this provides a lot of flexibility, but on the other hand, it can also mean that more configuration of the bundler itself can be required. Since we want to reduce the amount of time you have to spend on configuring the bundler, we look at which functionality is commonly used and try to provide simple toggles directly from within the Gradle plugins. One common example for this is style sheets. Whether you are writing your own CSS or are depending on some React component from NPM, which comes with style sheets, you're going to need the appropriate loader for Webpack to handle the styles correctly. So, Kotlin 1.4 adds CSS support to the Gradle plugins. Once enabled in your build file via the appropriate flags, your project will auto-configure Webpack to use style and CSS loaders in its configuration without any further manual changes required. If you have more advanced use cases, you could also take a look at the documentation for Kotlin.js, where we cover the available, more fine-grained inclusion and exclusion rules for this configuration. Now, for now, as you can see, CSS support has to be enabled for the three tasks, webpack task, run task, and test task individually. 
we realized that a majority of Kotlin JS developers will probably enable or disable all three of these options simultaneously. So we're looking into providing a single point of configuration for CSS support to make these snippets just a little bit more concise as well. Let's move on to what's new in managing NPM dependencies from the Gradle plugins. Now, as mentioned previously, the plugins for Kotlin JS allow you to manage your dependencies from NPM, just like any other dependencies from Gradle, by using the NPM function. Internally, this generates the appropriate entry for the dependency in the auto-generated package JSON file of your project. To help reduce strange surprises, with Kotlin 1.4, we are actually also requiring you to specify a version number or a range for the NPM packages you want to use. To have more fine-grained control over the context in which your dependencies are actually required, we also introduce three additional functions, dev NPM, optional NPM, and peer NPM, which allow you to express the corresponding concepts directly from your Gradle build file. Of course, Adding NPM dependencies is only half the process. We also want to be able to use these dependencies from Kotlin. We can, of course, as usual, write the required external declarations by hand. We could use official or community contributed wrappers and then use the JavaScript libraries through those. But we are also working on functionality to automate this process. With our experimental Ducat tool, these Kotlin external declarations can be generated based on type information included with the NPM packages. With Kotlin 1.4, we actually provide two different ways of invoking Ducat for dependencies in your project. The first is to run the generation at build time. To enable Ducat to generate external declarations for an individual dependency, you can just pass the generate externals parameter to the NPM function. You can also set a default behavior, which is only overwritten by these individual settings using the generate externals property in your Gradle properties file. Now, we believe that Ducat is an important strategic part of Kotlin JS, and we continue actively investing in it. But since it is currently still experimental and its generated output can be volatile, you might need to apply further changes or fixes to the declaration as it generates. Now, to make this easier, we are introducing the Generate Externals Gradle task in Kotlin 1.4. You can invoke it manually to trigger Ducat's generation of declarations to a separate folder. You can then tweak that code to your liking and copy it to your project source directory. Now, of course, this requires some manual input, but this approach allows you to use Ducat as guidance towards correct external declarations for your project. Now, Let's move on and talk a little bit about the browser APIs. So the libraries that allow you to make use of the functionality provided by modern browsers, from the Fetch API to drawing on canvases to interacting with DOM elements. Historically, both the Kotlin browser and the Kotlin DOM packages were part of the Kotlin standard library. And as such, they had the same release cycles as the rest of the language. To allow us to deliver these improvements to DOM and browser-related APIs independently of Kotlin's language release cycles, we are starting a gradual shift for these packages towards separate artifacts with Kotlin 1.4. The first step for this is moving the packages to Kotlin X. Kotlin Browser becomes Kotlin X Browser, Kotlin DOM becomes Kotlin X DOM. For now, you don't need to add any additional artifacts to your application in order to continue using these APIs. Your IDE will help you to automatically adjust your import statements to the new packages, and everything will continue working as normal. As we move further with this process of decoupling, we will introduce a separate dependency for these browsers and DOM declarations. And here we can then improve the quality and the correctness independently of the language schedule. While we are on the topic of platform APIs, I also want to mention Kotlin X Node.js. Now, while it was possible to execute Kotlin JS code in a Node.js runtime for a while, for example, to facilitate serverless applications or interact with server-side JavaScript, there were no official declarations available for the API which is exposed by the Node.js platform. Kotlin X Node.js provides external declarations for using exactly those APIs from Kotlin code targeting JavaScript. That means you'll be able to type safely access features that the Node.js platform has to offer, which might not be available in browsers or in JavaScript by default. 
Things like doing DNS lookups to pick out a completely arbitrary example. Because Kotlin X Node.js is still experimental, there can be some inconsistent or missing declarations. Still, we invite you to experiment with the library and leave any feedback you might have in its GitHub issue tracker. Now, up until now, we only talked about topics that are all available as is once you have your project uh, upgraded to Kotlin 1.4. But since the subject matter is Kotlin JS in 1.4 and beyond, I also want to talk about the next evolutionary step for Kotlin JS. And in fact, it is actually one that you can try right now. What I'm talking about is the new Alpha IR compiler for Kotlin JS. Sounds fancy, right? Well, the new compiler is going to be the main focus of innovation for Kotlin JS. As the naming suggests, it currently has alpha stability level. You can find more information about what promises and commitments we make about something with alpha stability level on the corresponding Kotlin evolution page. But the team is, who is responsible for the Kotlin JS IR compiler is working hard to make it the new default and with it improve topics around speed, around bundle size, and also around interoperability with the JavaScript and TypeScript ecosystems. Let's take a closer look at how the new compiler attempts to excel in some of these areas, starting with the bundle size. Now, when talking with uh, folks using Kotlin.js, we've often heard the demand for smaller bundle size, especially in larger projects or when the application spans multiple Gradle modules. The model used by the new IR compiler allows us to strengthen the dead code elimination capacity, making it possible to generate production executables that are much smaller than their counterpart created with the current compiler. The team is also actively working on providing a basic form of per module code splitting, which you will be able to configure as usual from your Gradle build file. By leveraging code splitting, larger projects can reduce the size of the first chunk that needs to be loaded, which promises improvements around metrics like the first meaningful paint. The team has also planned to gradually introduce more ES6 features in the compilation output of Kotlin.js with the IR compiler. One planned example for this would be ES6 modules, as opposed to the current support for UMD, AMD, and CommonJS. Not only would this allow you to export your Kotlin code as nice and modern ES6 modules, but this also unlocks more optimizations in regards to bundle size. The keyword here is tree shaking, something that allows Webpack, the bundler we use for Kotlin.js, to remove unused symbols and modules from your production code, improving load times and overall bundle size. The team is also looking at adding other ES6 features like classes at a later point. Now, of course, one essential step for making the new compiler the default is feature parity. The version of the Alpha IR compiler, which you can try right now, already includes many of the features available in the current default compiler. But some features are still missing. One such feature is source map support, for example. Source maps are what make it possible for you to open your browser's dev tools and see and debug Kotlin code here, rather than just seeing minified JavaScript. We understand that, especially for finding bugs, this functionality is very convenient, so we are, of course, committed to providing the same feature in the IR compiler. I want to touch on one more topic which I mentioned in the beginning of this chapter, and that is the interoperability between Kotlin and the JavaScript and TypeScript ecosystems. We think it's really important that Kotlin.js plays nice with other web technologies and that you can conveniently use it alongside them. There are developers writing full Kotlin applications that run in the browser today, for example, with React and the corresponding official Kotlin wrappers library. And while we are, of course, excited to see these full Kotlin web applications, this might not be possible for everyone. If you're working in a project that already has an established JavaScript code base, for example, or are working in a team that has a large collective knowledge of web technologies, rewriting it in Kotlin doesn't sound like an appealing or productive approach. You might also need or want to work with frameworks that require specific tooling or have other specific constraints. For situations like these, we've identified a strong interoperability and a convenient way to consume Kotlin code from JavaScript to be highly important. And this is once again a topic our developers are committed to tackling with the new Kotlin.js IR compiler. The mechanism that lays the groundwork for this interop is the experimental JS export annotation which is introduced for the new Kotlin compiler. 
The principle behind using it is simple. If you want to export a top-level declaration, like a class or function to the JavaScript world, you would simply add this annotation to it. It's also available in Kotlin common code, so if you have a multi-platform project uh, and you want to export something common, that is also perfectly permissible. If you want to export all declarations in a file, you might also want to use uh, the add file annotation. That is also perfectly valid. The new Kotlin.js compiler will then make sure that the definition you marked will be accessible from JavaScript and from TypeScript. And on the topic of TypeScript, I want to show off another feature that's currently in preview, which I'm very excited about in the new compiler. And that is the automatic generation of TypeScript definitions from Kotlin code. Now, when a declaration is marked to be exported to JavaScript, a DTS file is automatically generated alongside the compiled code, which includes TypeScript definitions corresponding to the exported Kotlin declarations. We hope that the JS export annotation together with this feature will really incentivize folks to employ Kotlin JS in polyglot teams, similar to that of other Kotlin multi-platform applications, where the web professionals in your team can still use the technologies they want to use, like TypeScript, but you can still avoid duplicating work for business logic heavy implementations, creating API wrappers, and more. While the implementation for this feature is not finalized yet, all exported Kotlin declarations already receive TypeScript definitions when building with the new compiler. From the perspective of a front-end developer, using such a Kotlin.js library won't look much different from using any other TypeScript library. In this example, we have a TypeScript project set up in WebStorm, which references the compiled library from the previous slides. As you can see, the symbols can be just imported, objects can be created, functions can be called, just in the same way as you would anything else from TypeScript. The tooling support that these definitions enable in your IDE makes it really easy to discover the APIs and the way that Kotlin exposes them. And because the new compiler still just generates regular JavaScript modules, no additional magic is required on the consumer's end besides locally resolving the dependency. And that's something that's comfortably supported by all major bundlers like Parcel.js, Webpack, and others. We're looking forward to see you experiment with these new features in the new compiler, and of course, we ask you to give us feedback. The keyword of experimentation provides a great segue to my next point, how to actually try out the new compiler for Kotlin.js. Because it can actually be enabled with a simple flag which is available with Kotlin 1.4. Simply set the compiler type to IR, either in your JavaScript target configuration or in your Gradle properties file. At that point, you're all set and can compile your project with the new and shiny IR compiler, given that the dependencies of your project are also already supporting the new backend. If you are using Kotlin.js for building a library, we are of course excited to see you try the new compiler as well and publish compatible artifacts. To make this comfortable for you, we've added a few things to smooth the transition. Firstly, to make it easy to switch between the two compilers, we've actually made the JS export annotation, which we got to know earlier, available in the legacy compiler as well. Here, it will only turn off name mangling for the annotated declaration, but this should still make it easier for you to switch back and forth between the two compilers. We have also introduced a third choice for the compiler settings alongside IR and legacy, which represents the current default compiler. This setting is called both. As its name might suggest, selecting the both mode for the Kotlin compiler will take your Kotlin code and run it through both the legacy and IR compiler, generating artifacts in the formats used by each backend. Through the magic of Gradle metadata, both of these artifacts can actually be published under the same Maven coordinate. When you depend on a library compiled in both mode, the correct artifact will automatically be chosen at build time. If you are a Kotlin.js library developer, we encourage you to start compiling your project in both mode. Nothing scary will happen to your users who are using the default compiler, and you will make it possible for early adopters of the new compiler to use your library. Well, that was a lot of information surrounding the new Kotlin.js compiler. If you want to explore the topic at your own pace and familiarize yourself with it in more depth, take a look at the corresponding documentation on kotlinlang.org and give it a try. As always, we are highly interested in any feedback, bug reports, or issues that you encounter and share with us. Now, before we round out this Kotlin.js journey with a short summary, 
We want to share a brief update on one more subject which is interesting in the concept of Kotlin in the browser, and that is Kotlin for WebAssembly. As you may know, the development efforts around Kotlin for WebAssembly have been going on for a while, and they've been making some exciting progress recently. Two team members working on the Kotlin JS team have joined the WebAssembly community working group and represent the interests of Kotlin there. Our developers are also in close contact with teams implementing the virtual machines which execute WebAssembly code. One key feature of these VMs that Kotlin wants to make use of is a managed garbage collected runtime. Now, the proposal for such a runtime has not yet been finalized, but we have already started working with prototype implementations of such an environment. We have high hopes for Kotlin on WebAssembly, and we are working super hard to get a first very experimental prototype of the technology into your hands to try and play around with. Well, that about concludes our journey through the present and future of Kotlin JS. Thanks for sticking with me. Let us quickly summarize the topics we tackled in the last half hour or so. We saw that Kotlin 1.4 brings a clear starting point with the JS and multi-platform plugins, both of which use the same configuration DSL. A DSL that now supports CSS styling out of the box, provides multiple options for how to define NPM dependencies, and integrates the Ducat generator tool. We also had a brief glance into the future of the browser and Node.js APIs, and dove a bit deeper into the new Alpha AR compiler for Kotlin JS, with topics like improved bundle size and TypeScript JavaScript interoperability. I hope you were able to learn something new and are as excited as I am about the topics that are still upcoming. If you want to learn more about how to try out the features we described, you actually have multiple options. The Kotlin website comes with a what's new section for Kotlin 1.4, which allows you to jump to Kotlin JS related topics easily. Don't forget to also check out the Kotlin 1.4 release blog post for detailed information on the release, and feel free to join the dialogue in the JavaScript channel on Slack. We are excited to hear about your feedback there, as well as on the official Kotlin issue tracker on Utrack. Thank you for tuning in, and have a nice Kotlin! <laughs>